Hi everybody. Now I don't know if I'm online. I had a bit of technical difficulty, so I'm not sure if it all worked. I had to restart all over again. I forgot to press one button. So um, live and learn. I'm just in a different uh, room in the house today. Uh, it's 7 p.m. my time, so I've got all my family home, so they've all been, um, uh, I suppose, shooed off to their bedroom, so they're not happy with me at the moment, but too bad, too sad. <laughs> I've got control of the house today, so um, I'm just in the little office, and it's probably, we haven't got the sound right, so the sound's probably a little bit tinny, so apologies for that, but we'll have to work that one out in the future. So if this doesn't work in here, we'll um, we'll do it, probably I'll do it back out in the lounge room. <laughs> so for dummy four. Hope everybody's well. <clears throat> Hello everybody. Hi Yeti. Hi Lisa. And is it Michi? And I can't pronounce that name. That looks like in Thai. I cannot pronounce that. But hello everybody. It's great to to see you. Hi Steve. How are you doing from Malaysia? Um, I'm excited to share with you again. Um, I've been looking forward to sharing this message with you since the last time that I shared. Uh, I've had this message on my heart since then uh, to share with you. So I just pray it's going to be a blessing to you today. Um, I just, there's a few people on there with chat. It's so good to have the chat there and just really connect with people. Hi, Peace. How are you doing? So it's, it just uh, as I've moved the time around a bit, so 7 p.m. my time, uh, I think those in uh, Europe uh, can get involved. I noticed someone today messaged that they're from South Africa, that they're um, hoping to join us. I think it's 10 a.m., in Europe, around in UK, and um, around 11, I think she said, in South Africa. So apologies to those in America that uh, were with me last time, but hopefully next time I'll um, do another early Saturday morning one for you. So we'll see how we go. I had an appointment this morning, so I couldn't do it this morning anyway. So God bless you all. I hope everybody's well. Uh, has anybody got any testimonies or anything they wanted to share? If you want to put that in chat for me and, and see what's happening in your life and how you're doing... I hope everybody's well. <clears throat> I think my chat's frozen. But um, this is all. I'll just get everything ready to go for my um, PowerPoint. And I don't know what I'm doing. There we go. That's going to be ready to go in a second. So I'm going to share a message with you today. I believe it's going to be a word in season. So I pray that it will really refresh you and help you in your journey. There we go. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you for your goodness and I thank you for everything that you've done for us through your son. Father, I pray for every single person under the sound of my voice. Those uh, that are listening here live and watching live and those that will watch later on in the recording of YouTube. And Father, I uphold every single person uh, under the sound of my voice. And I pray that the goodness of God will be made manifest in your life in the land of the living. And I pray that as I share about God's goodness today, that that you will really come to know the truth, that he is with you and he is for you always. Father, I thank you that your goodness will manifest and they will feel your goodness and your love toward them as I share today. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And I've just noticed as I've um, put the, this um, PowerPoint up that um, uh, Sean's got a new computer. He doesn't have the same font. So all my hours I spent on my fonts have all disappeared. <laughs> On my face, on my um, PowerPoint presentation. You know what? It is what it is. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what I just wanted to share with you today, I'm going to share about the goodness of God and what I felt last time. Because um, I always pray about what I'm going to share with you. I don't like just to pick something out of, you know, my hat or something that I've got on my heart. I always like to be led in what I share with you. And I really felt God say to share about his goodness and share about his nature and character as outlined in his word. And I think that when you understand who the Father is, your life will never be the same again. How you see your circumstances, how you view your life, how you even view others, it, it does change. Uh, I was brought up uh, really scared of God. Um, my mum, very well meaning, uh, used to always say to me, uh, you better watch what you do. You better watch what you get up to. You know, you better do what you're told because God's always watching. And so if anything bad happened to me in my life, you'd go, what have you done wrong? You know, you've been punished by God. And, you know, that was just how she was raised and what she believed. Um, she since has changed. She now attends my uh, our church. 
and uh, has been such a blessing to us. And, and she's said that she's been totally changed with her view of God. But that's sort of my background where I came from, that I, that I just sort of felt that, God, you know, you stay up there, you stay in your corner and I'll stay in my corner. And, and I'll kind of worship you from afar off because I was kind of just didn't really know who he was. Because you read the God in the Old Testament, he looked a bit mean and nasty, you know, and then you see Jesus and Jesus is this amazing representation of God's love. And in Hebrews 1.3, it says Jesus is the exact representation of the Father. He's the express image of his person. You know, Jesus himself said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, at least believe in the miracles that I do. You know, so if you look at Jesus, you really see the truth of who the Father is. In uh, 1 John, it says, uh, I think in verse 17, it says, grace, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came from our Lord Jesus Christ. And then uh, verse 18, it says, no one has ever seen the Father, no one, but it says the Son um, Jesus has made him known. He has revealed him. He's, uh, I think the Amplified says he's brought him out to the open and shown him as he really is. So it, and I think if you understand that when you read the Bible, that the Bible is written in progressive revelation. Okay, not everybody really understood who the nature and the, the character of the Father was. And so I'll go through Bible interpretation a little bit later down the track, but I thought, and I'll share this in a little bit more detail what I'm just sort of introducing you with now, but um, it's important to note that when you pick up the Bible and read it, that um, it was written with progressive revelation. Elijah, Moses, David, uh, you know, and Elisha, all those guys, even Abraham, they only knew a, a little bit of who the father was. They just had a viewed or a, a, um, a dull or dimmed view. It was only until Jesus, who was the exact representation, brought him out in the open and showed him to be a loving heavenly father. And that's what I want you to leave with uh, today after this message is to know that God is good. God, In fact, God is only ever and always good. If you read something in the Bible that where God does not seem uh, only ever and always good, uh, then you may be reading it out of context or misunderstanding uh, where, where it all fits into everything. But when you sort of take that veil off, um, the, the God's out to punish you and smite you and kill you, uh, when you know how to rightly divide the word and you see that God is only ever and always good, you actually see that on every single page. And when you understand what the Bible is, what the Bible isn't, because uh, it's just really been taken out of context a lot today. Um, but ultimately, the Bible, I was taught the Bible, um, where every time you picked it up, you had to read it with the view of what must I do for God? What must I do? That is the absolute wrong thing to do when you pick up the Bible. The Bible isn't written for us to tell us what to do about our life. The Bible is all written about Jesus. The volume of the book is written about him, he said in, in Hebrews 10. It all points to him. So when we open our Bibles, we should say, see and look for who is Jesus and what has he done for me? You know, what is God's plan of redemption here? for me and and if you just change that view you see god's goodness and you sh see jesus finished work shine through through the the majority of the pages there it's so exciting so today i'm going to be um just sharing on god's goodness and i've just sort of opened here you probably read ahead while i've just been introducing uh this message that you know when you feel that and you've been waiting for a breakthrough and it's been a period of time it's very easy to feel like you know, especially as you see the, the, you know, weeks or months or even years uh, tick by, it's very easy to feel uh, that God is choosing to bless some people over others. It's also easy to, to feel like God um, ha has forgotten you. And, and, it, and I do believe, not just through personal ex ex circumstances and experiences, but I do believe that just really misunderstanding Scripture and, and who God is can really uh, change that view of how we see him as well. There really is that confusion. And so these are just some of the things that, that I've heard, um, and you probably have too. Um, I've ministered to many women that are, were told by well-meaning believers and uh, leaders, uh, people uh, in their church and just wherever they, you know, through ministries and whatever, that, that this is kind of how it is with God. So if you, you are believing for a breakthrough and you're not experiencing a breakthrough, then this is how it is. And this is just some of the things that they share. And uh, for those of you who um, have uh, seen all my Facebook lives, you'll remember my very first one, 
I shared a message called Don't Blame God. And I encourage you, if you haven't seen that, to watch that. And because this will really piggyback um, that message. And it, well, I suppose I'm going to expand on what I, I began to share on that one. And it's just a really simple truth. There. And for those that have sort of watched some of my videos will see that um, you've probably heard probably all of this in many of my messages that what I'm sharing, but I'm just sort of putting it all together today uh, in one uh, hopefully cohesive message for you. But these are some of the things that we're told that when things don't go as planned, when something adverse happens to us. So many, actually, a lot of people actually do believe this, that God has a better plan for your life. You know, so, um, so say for those who are believing for children, I um, mean, I've heard it said, you know, well, maybe it's not God's plan for your life. Maybe he wants you to be a missionary out in the back of whoop, whoop somewhere. Um, so children, you, you know, would be a hindrance. And well, I just think that's crazy because there's so many missionaries with children <laughs> that can do that. And I don't, God created families. I, don't, I just don't get that. I mean, I understand why people will say that. And this is all well-meaning, but none of this is truth. None of this lines up with the Bible as a whole. None of it lines up with Jesus' finished work. Okay, so it all sounds good. It sounds Christian. It sounds comforting, but I, I don't, I ne never found any of this comforting. So God's got a plan, a better plan for your life. Maybe it's not God's will for you. Maybe God's trying to teach you something. Um, gee, <laughs> great. You know, maybe God is testing you. Maybe you have sin in your life or unforgiveness. You know, we've probably all heard that one. Um, but what did Jesus come to do? He came to forgive us of all sin and all unrighteousness and to provide a new way to approach God, which was by faith in him. Not by our goodness and by our works, but by putting our faith in him and his goodness and his good, what he did for us, his good works, if you like. So the other one is maybe you need deliverance. Maybe there's a demonic bondage there preventing you from having children or healing if you need a healing in your life or a financial breakthrough uh, or relationship breakthrough uh, that maybe you don't have enough faith. That's my number one pet hate. I think it's crazy uh, because we all have faith. Faith is also a gift from God. He's created it to be so simple and easy as a way for us to respond to his free gift of life. But people have made it so complicated and difficult. And that's why it really annoys me when I hear crazy teaching on faith. Um, or the other thing is you need to pray and fast more. Or you need to be more spiritual, maybe. Maybe you just, you know, many different reasons. I'm sure that some of you have heard some of these as well. You know, and um, or maybe God wants you to grow spiritually. And, and another absolute pet hate of mine is maybe God's waiting for a perfect time. You know, so maybe God's withholding healing from you, you know, or withholding the healing blood of Jesus just for a perfect time. It just doesn't make sense. It sounds good, sounds Christian, but it doesn't line up with the cross. And hopefully you'll be able to see that today as I go through this message. You know, so it's well-meaning, but none of this lines up to with who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Okay, so before we begin, I just want to share that um, God's will is known and very easy to determine and this is for every area of your life okay you might say is it god's will for me to have children or a family one two child two child three three children uh is it god's will for me to be healed is it got you know all there's so many uh different questions that you can ask but the answer is so incredibly simple and here are just two script, different scriptures that will define god's will for all of mankind and and i think we just make everything confusing when we take our eyes off Jesus and his finished work and we start to look at personal circumstances. It, the waters begin to become muddy. You know, we begin to become confused and then we, you know, and it just, it, it just becomes complicated. But God has made everything simple and through Jesus it's simple. So look at this, John 6, 38 to 40, and I love, love, love this. Jesus says, For I've come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my father's will is that everyone who looks to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life and I will raise him up that last day, on the last day. 
Amen. It's God's will that no man shall perish, another scripture says. So God's not willing. It's not God's will for any man to perish, but all to come into that saving knowledge of the truth, which is by putting faith in Jesus. Another scripture that talks about God's will is here in Hebrews chapter 10. And chapter 10 outlines the new covenant. I love it. It's so good. And at the beginning, I kept it in there. It says in my, um, uh, the, on the actually, actually biblehub.com, no, sorry, biblegateway.com, it says Christ's death fulfills God's will. <laughs> there I have given it all away. Christ's death has forgive God's will. And, and this is speaking of Jesus, and it says, When he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. And then I said, Behold, I have come. And look at this. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. This is Jesus. The whole book points to him, not to you, but to him, who he is and what he has done for us. You know, and why? To do your will, O God. Previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire nor had pleasure in them. And then in brackets here, it says, which were or which are offered according to the law. Okay, thank God we're no longer under the law. We've been redeemed from that law of sin and death. And then verse 9 says, then he said, behold, I've come to do your will, O God. So he's repeating himself again. And this is quoting Jeremiah. I think it's Jeremiah 31. So, so it's a direct quote of what was mentioned there. And it says, he takes away the first to establish the second. It's talking about covenants. So that by that will, okay, so by the will of God, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now, I love Hebrews 10. It's, it, you know, <laughs> and if you read Hebrews 1 chapters right through 10, you see that the author here is arguing the case that Jesus is better and greater than, ev and than everything under that old mosaic law under the old covenant that god's will and the bottom line here is that every time you look at what god's will is it all points to jesus so the answer for your life if you say is it god's will for me to be healed to have a baby to have this to that whatever the answer is jesus god's will for your life is jesus and his finished work look to him and what he has done for you that is god's will for you not what you experience, not what the doctors say, what your diagnosis says, what your past says, what other people's past experience says, but what Jesus has done for you because everything is found in him. So if you want to know, you know, is it God's will for me to, to be healed? Yes, because Jesus provided healing on the cross for you. Is it God's will for me for someone to be saved, to come to the knowledge of the truth? Absolutely yes. We know that doesn't mean everybody comes into it because people through their own free will can reject Jesus' sacrifice. But the point is, God has provided it for everyone. It is His God, God's will for all mankind, for none to perish, but all to come into the saving knowledge of Jesus as the truth. So that is just really simply how to define God's will and word for your life. And so just I just want to go through now about the known character of God and what we know, what God says himself about his nature and his character. And this is just some of um, what I want to share today. I'm really, really, really going to try and stick to a uh, certain time slot. And, and starting at 7 o'clock my time is kind of going to help me, I think, on that. Um, but So I don't want to go over time like I did last time. Um, yes, so I really want to stick to this. So I've only just sort of condensed it down to as much as I can. Uh, and so I will share a little bit more on this uh, moving forward. But see, there's this, this really crazy teaching, um, and I don't want to offend anybody when I say this, but there's a, a basic belief in Christendom that, that God can do what he wants and whenever he wants to do it. And it's actually quite a damaging teaching because it, it's, it doesn't really portray the true nature and character of the Father. Um, so because how do you answer that when, say, someone gets tortured and killed and murdered? You know, you, if you say that God can do what he wants when he wants to, then why didn't he step in and stop that? I mean, there's so many other questions along that line. I'm not going to try and answer all that today, but I will over 
uh, the following um, my following messages. But the bottom line, if you know that God is only ever and always good, you know, and just that belief system that you know, it's pretty much essentially that God is in control of everything that happens. It's actually not scriptural. I do want to go into a bit on the the topic of sovereignty. And I'll go through that a little bit later down the track. It, it, a lot of people are very confused by it. But the bottom line is when it, it came in, if we really study where it came in through the church, and, and John Calvin was one of the main um, sort of um, church fathers that brought it in. But when you look at the history, his history, what he was, I think he was a lawyer by profession, and uh, he followed uh, St. Augustine. And he actually said that I get my uh, views and beliefs from Augustine. And if you then look at Augustine and study him, and he, he was another type of lawyer. So they weren't really scholars from way back. They just sort of were self-professed um, Bible teachers, if you like. So if you really sort of break it down and look at the history, um, and then you look at Augustine, look at who he followed and who he, where he got his foundation of, it was of dualism. It was of pagan teaching. So I don't have really enough time to go through that, but we do have a message on our church website that sort of uh, covers a little bit more detail on that, on the history of that. But really, you've got to look at Jesus. If you want to find out who the Father is, who the Father isn't, it's very simple. Look to Jesus. Jesus is perfect theology. Absolutely. And he came to show us God's true nature and God's true character, that he is only ever and always good. But see, if you believe that God is testing you or um, allowing you to suffer or, um, you know, any of those things that I shared previously, you know, he's, you know, wanting you to become more spiritual, he's waiting for a perfect time, all those sort of things. How, honestly, how can you truly trust him? How can you trust him with your life? How can you trust him with your womb for those who want children? How can you trust him with the, your womb, your children, your future, if you don't really know with, if his heart is good towards you, if it is his will or not? You know, you might say you do, but you can't if you don't think that he's good and what he has for you is good. So I will go into that a lot more detail later down the track. And I hope I haven't opened up too much can of worms here for you. But um, we'll go through a little bit more of that today. I think I've skipped a page here. Yeah, I have. I must have pressed a... Here we go. I have definitely skipped a couple of pages. Hmm. Yep, there we go. Sorry. Um, oh, my pages have all got um, mixed up a bit. So bottom line here is God is love. This is so important. As we begin to now to uh, unravel God's nature and God's character, 1 John 4, 8 and verse uh, 16 says, He does, who does not love does not go know God, for God is love. And then John says in verse 16, and we know we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Bottom line, God is love. It's who he is. It's not what he does. It's who he is. So everything that comes from the Father, every motive, every action always comes from love. Because we're going to see here that God cannot change. So he can't be love one day and not love the next. Okay, it's impossible for him to change. There's no variation. There's no shadow of turning for God in any way, shape or form. This is who he is. And what I love in 1 Corinthians 13, you know, the great love chapter. You know how I was taught this chapter and, and what uh, Paul was saying in 1 Corinthians 13 is this is what we must do. You know, this is how you must act. But the new covenant doesn't put a demand on you to perform. The new covenant is all about the Father giving you everything through the spirit of his Son and then you living out of that. So God, who is love, has poured love in you, his love in you, and then goes, now live out of that. Let that flow out from you. So it's not a demand, it's a provision. He provides you with everything you need for life and for godliness. And I think it's 2 Peter 1. Uh, two to three says that that God has given us everything for life and godliness. It says through the knowledge of him and it says he's given us his very good and precious promises so that through them we can escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. Love that scripture. So but here in 1 Corinthians 13, the great love chapter, look at what love is. 
And remember, God is love. This is who God is. And the New King James says, love, it says it does not behave rudely, does not seek its own will, is not provoked, thinks no evil. This is God. He doesn't seek his own will. A New Living Translation says, love, God who is love is not rude. He does not demand his own way. He is not irritable. And look at this. He keeps no records of being wronged. How many of us know of the new covenant in Hebrews 10 where it says your sins under the new covenant, the new covenant I'm going to establish through the Jesus and his finished work. He says your sin and your unrighteous deeds I will remember no more. God who is love keeps no record of wrongs. And then the message I love, I love just how it puts it. And I like reading out different translations because I really feel it sort of um, really expands and amplifies um, the point of what I want to make. So the message version says, Love doesn't force itself upon others and doesn't keep a score of sin of others, the sins of others. So this is, you know, this is awesome because this is who God is towards us. But look at this. He doesn't force himself on others. And this is important to understand because while we know God's nature and character that, that it, he is of love, you know, and I was saying earlier that some believe that God can do what he wants and when he wants to do it. But, and so God can do anything. God's can, in control of everything, but it's actually not the truth. Now we know that God is omnipotent, which means he's all powerful. He's omni, omniscient, which means he's all knowing and he's omnipresent, which means he's always with us. But just because you're all powerful, all knowing, and everywhere or you know always with us doesn't mean that can change everything that happens in our lives okay god who is love and god who is all powerful there are some things that his love and his power can't reach now before you think i'm a heretic i'm going to explain that a little bit in detail but this is important to understand god has given us a free will Okay, God will not violate that free will. It's a gift. And we're going to learn as well as we go through. God cannot take back his gifts that he gives. He can't do that. He can't go, here, I give you free will. And then when he sees you about to mess up, he can't then step in and go, no, I'm going to stop you. Because he is then taken back and stood in and broken his word and taken back that gift that he's given to you. That's exactly the same of what happened with Adam and Eve. He gave them the free will. He gave dominion. Uh, for him to rule and reign over all the earth that was given to Adam and Eve. God couldn't step in and take that back when he saw him uh, with uh, Lucifer in that garden, you know, with Satan, the serpent, who came as a, came as a cunning one to deceive. Um, he couldn't come in and stop him from partaking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because he would have been breaking and altering his word and covenant that he made with Adam. That he, I give you, you can rule and reign. You have dominion. I'm giving you uh, um, authority over all the works of my hands. So he couldn't step in and alter his word, break his covenant, um, you know, or take back that free will he had given. So, and so just another example here that I've got here on my notes. See, some things are not a love issue. Some things are not a power issue because you can throw all your love and all your power upon a race or people and it doesn't mean that can change their heart back towards you. You know, we saw with Pharaoh that God's goodness with Pharaoh, but he hardened his heart against God. You know, the Israelites, we see through the Old Testament, no matter how much love, no, no matter how much power that God put towards or threw towards the Israelites, if you like, it didn't make them respond favorably to him. In fact, there were times they rejected him and they bowed down and they worshipped other gods, even though God's love in his heart was always towards them. So God could only help them and protect them and bless them when they were listening and responding to him. If they were not listening and responding, he couldn't reach them. You know, and ultimately there was a whole generation that ended up dying in the wilderness because they weren't going to follow God into the promised land. You know, they were, got caught up on what they could see with the giants in the land. They didn't believe God's promise. There was only, you know, Caleb and Joshua uh, who took God at his word and his promise to them. But the others were, they just, you know, they were not going to follow him in. He couldn't lead them in. So unfortunately, they all died in the wilderness. 
So I hope you can understand that just some things are not a love issue and a power issue. Um, there's a saying, E.W. Bullinger, one of the, a resource that I read often, It's um, it, but it's like a dictionary. So it's not like a, a book you can read. And I want to talk about this a little bit later on when we talk about Bible interpretation. But E.W. Bullinger wrote a book called Figures of Speech Used in the Bible. And there's over 217 <laughs> figures of speech. So when it talks about um, God hardening Pharaoh's heart, um, there's a, I think there's about 20 to 25 scriptures that say God hardened Pharaoh's heart. But there's this same amount that said that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. So which one's true? You know, is God playing cat and mouse here? And it's like, no, it, it's not. One, it's an idiom of permission. And I will go through that in detail as I go through Bible interpretation. I cover figures of speech. Because it is. It's a figure of speech. Speech. It's an idiom of permission. It's not literal. God didn't literally harden and then soften Pharaoh's heart. Okay, but Pharaoh hardened his own heart against God's goodness. And uh, E.W. Bullinger says the same sun that melts the wax can also harden the clay. So you think of a heart that's um, like the sun that shines down and you, you have wax and you have clay. Um, the sun could be shining with all its love and all its power, but with one, with the wax it will melt, but with the clay it will become hard. The, the sun hasn't changed. The sun didn't cause it. It was the condition of the heart or the condition of the, the material, the substance that was changed. Another example, I was thinking I was I had an appointment this morning and I was driving and I, and I, th I thought of this one. I thought this is awesome. Is another example you think of like you get a pot of boiling water and you throw in an egg and say you throw in a potato, you know, and you time it for 10 minutes. In 10 minutes, the egg is hard. It's hard boiled, you know, but the, the potato has become soft. And then if you then boil it for another 10 minutes, I mean, that egg is going to be rock solid, but the potato is going to break down. So what is in the water is going to get into that potato and it gets all mushy. And the more you boil it, the more the potato becomes one with the water. It's affected by the water, but it's not the water to, that's determining it, the outcome there. It's the substance. It's the condition of the heart. You know, so I hope you can understand that. So if your heart is not open and responsive, then God can th throw as much love and, and power towards you, but you still have that free will to resist. Now, that's important to understand in a prayer situation because like, um, and I've seen this happen, unfortunately, too often, but where a spouse might, might run off uh, with somebody else or reject the other partner in the marriage and, and want a divorce and you, you can pray to your blue in the face about throw, shining God's love on their heart. Um, God cannot change them. Um, there's one scripture that says God changed Saul's heart. But if you look at the context there, what's happening is that when Saul responded to God, his heart was changed. It's, it's another sort of figure of speech. It wasn't literally that God went, right, you now believe me. Right, you don't believe me. Right, your heart, heart soft. Right, your heart, your heart is now hard. It's not how God operates at all. Okay, so in that, if we understand the parameters of God, that in our prayer life, then, you know, you'll stop those prayers that are like, I, I, you know, it, it's kind of like when we pray, God change them, God bring them back. God won't force himself on someone they need to respond. It's kind of like a witchcraft prayer and God doesn't respond to that because he cannot force someone against their own will. So I think if we understand this, then we can go, okay, God, I need to have an ear to hear. Give me wisdom on how I can pray for that person. Give me wisdom on what I can say or maybe what I not to say um, so that I can show your love to them and that we can see a favorable outcome. Okay, so I hope you can understand that one there. I shared a little bit more than what I wanted to today on that, but I hope it's just going to give you a little bit more of a hunger and an interest for understanding a little bit more on Bible interpretation and to really understand the goodness of God when you read Scripture. Okay, so we're going to now go through things because people say that God can do whatever he wants to do. God can do what he wants and when he wants to do it. But I'm going to show you a whole lot of things that what God says himself or what he cannot do. There's a few things that God cannot do. Okay, and one is God cannot lie. Okay, so if you say that God can do what he wants and when he wants to do it, you know what? That's not the truth because he cannot. Not that he chooses to, he cannot. It's not a part of his nature or character. He cannot lie. 
And, and the scriptures here is uh, Romans 3, 4, uh, the new revised standard version, I think that uh, is. You can look this up if you go to uh, biblegateway.com and you just put in one reference, uh, like Romans 3, 4. If you go underneath, it will say all English translations. You click on that, you get all the free trans or all the translations that are there available on Bible Gateway for you. And so um, the Romans 3, Paul, Paul says, although, and I like this translation, he says, although everyone is a liar, let God be proved true. Uh, other translation says that every man is a liar, but God isn't. God is only true. And then Hebrews 6, 18, and we're going to go through this in a second, Hebrews 6, but it says, it is impossible for God to lie. God cannot lie. It is impossible. Do you know what that means? Do you know what impossible means? Impossible. Not possible. He cannot lie. And I'm going to share something with you. Amazing, which is going to lead to my next point. Numbers 23:19 in there, and this is the New International, says that God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? And it says, I have received a command to bless. He has blessed and I can not change it. And I'm just going to go through this very briefly. I went through this in a lot of detail. We did a series on curses in our church and curses in, under the new covenant. Unfortunately, a lot of those teachings have been misplaced and they're on this there's two places. It's either a, a hard drive we can't find or another one that's just non-responsive. So I may have to redo these. There's probably about half a dozen lessons we did on this and I covered this in detail. And I just want to give you a snippet today because I'm going to give you enough today that you can then go and do some study for yourself to find out the truth here. But this here, that's so um, Balaam, who was a, a pagan seer, uh, said this, God had given him the words to speak. So the story was that King Balak, and I think I've got that, yep. So King Balak, before we go on to my slide here, King Balak became threatened of the Israelites because they became so numerous, very numerous, and he was scared that they were going to come and overtake him. So he called for Balaam, who was a pagan seer, non-believer of God, to come and curse Israel. Three times. I mean, in fact, the first time that, that he called him as he was on his way, if you uh, know this account, that, that um, Balaam was on his donkey and the donkey saw this angel in front of him and, and Balak beat his um, donkey and God opened the donkey's mouth. And the donkey said, you know, have I ever let you down before, you know, and there's this discourse. Oh, and then Balaam sees this uh, angel there and God said flat out, you know, several times, do not go, do not go. But here he is on his donkey. He's determined to go. You know, when it comes to riches and honor and, you know, going to be paid a hefty sum to curse Israel. Well, you know, what does a pagan man do? He goes to curse Israel. So and then God then knowing that he was going to go regardless said, OK, right, fine, go. But I'm going to give you the words to speak. And so this is the second time that Balaam went to curse Israel. He says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man, the New King James says, that he should change his mind. He's, look at this. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? And look at this. He says, I have received a command to bless. He has blessed and I cannot change it. You know, this is awesome because th that what that means is God cannot reverse a blessing. He cannot reverse a blessing. It's impossible. And so, um, and and the, the third time that this, that actually prior to this, at the beginning, when Balaam, uh, when Balak first calls Balaam in verse, so Numbers 22, 12, this is what God said to Balaam. He said, you don't go, do not go. And you, why? This is why. So God said to Balaam, you shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people for they are blessed you know you cannot curse in other words what god has blessed it is impossible it is impossible to curse what god has blessed god cannot reverse the blessing amen that is so important to understand what did god do when he created adam and eve he blessed them 
And he said, I've got here in Genesis 1 to 28, God blessed them. He blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. No one, God, not even God can undo and break his word or alter his covenant. We're going to go through that in a second. When God blesses, he cannot take it back. He cannot reverse the blessing. He had blessed Israel. Okay, he blessed them through Adam and Eve. Then he blessed them through Abraham. He pronounced a blessing over them. And Balaam could not curse Israel because God had blessed them. No one can curse what God has blessed, not even God. God blessed Adam and Eve. He gave them everything within their bodies to go forth, be fruitful, and to multiply. Now, we know there was a fall and things began to change. We know that sickness and disease began to enter and change the world as we know it. In Romans 5.12, it says that death entered through sin. God did not create it. It all came in as a result of the fall. And just basically, there are three main reasons why we suffer. And that is because we live in a fallen world with fallen men who don't listen to God. And sometimes we don't even listen to God. And then there is an adversary, okay? So God's not a part of any of that. But God's blessing still stands forth. You know why? Because people are still going forth, being fruitful and multiplying. God had also spoken to the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, um, every creeping thing on the earth. In fact, every tree, every plant, he created everything with the seed within itself to reproduce after its own kind. Are trees still multiplying today? Absolutely. Are dogs and cats still multiplying? Absolutely. Everything still has the seed within itself. Everything is still, what's it called? Procreate. We are procreating. God's given us the ability with everything we need to go forth and be fruitful and multiply. That blessing is still there. God has not changed his mind. He has not changed his will uh, towards you. He's, you know, that still stands firm today. Adam and Eve represented all of mankind. Okay, so once again, the reason why... Uh, for those that are that are sick or have a sickness or a disease in their body, or maybe for those of you who want children, because I know everybody watching, uh, not everybody is after children, um, but those who are know that the reason you're not conceiving is because there is a sick, some sickness or a disease or a complication of some sort operating. It is never because God has reversed the blessing. It is never because that God has blocked or stopped or delayed this blessing. And, and you'll see that as we go through this message. Remember, infertility and miscarriage and whatever causes it. Those of you who might be pregnant and are suffering sickness and disease in that area or with problems with the growth and development of your baby, or maybe you're not watching today uh, for any uh, infertility or fertility issue, that, that maybe you just want to know about more about goodness or God's goodness, or maybe that you've got a sickness and disease in your body, um, know that God has not caused it in any way, shape, or form. So infertility and miscarriage, all that stuff, they're just different forms of sickness and disease that are operating in the reproductive organs. Whatever you're facing, just know if you can just see it, um, just, just don't see it as a magnified position. You know, all sickness is the same to God, whether it's a, a pimple on your, on your chin or whether it's uh, a cold, a sore throat or arthritis or, or even cancer. You know, as far as God's concerned, he sees it spiritually the same. And how does he see it? Defeated, disarmed through what Jesus did on the cross for you. So if we can get the revelation of that and start to see these things that we struggle with and see these things we are facing in the same light, it'll change your perspective and how you view them. And then I believe that's going to help you how you then uh, can move forward and begin to walk in victory over those things. So you bless, you excited that God cannot, cannot reverse the blessing. He cannot, not even God can curse what he's blessed. When he blesses, he blesses. When something's come out of his mouth, it's come out of his mouth. What did we see before here? You know, God's not a man that he should lie or a, a, a human that he should lie nor a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Absolutely. He does speak and act. He does promise and fulfill. You know, we are blessed and, and he has blessed us and no one can can change it. 
<laughs> and I've got another scripture here in Ephesians 1 3 says that he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. No one can reverse that blessing on your life. Amen. No one. It's good news. Absolutely good news. So we see there that God cannot lie. He cannot reverse a blessing and he cannot change. God is unchanging. Okay. And more specifically he God cannot change his mind, his will or his promise or even his nature and his character. God cannot change. In Malachi 3, 6, he says that I am the Lord. I do not change. He cannot change. It's impossible for him to change. And I love James 1, 17. It says every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. God does not change like the shifting shadows. If God changed even 0.001 of a degree, he would cast a shadow. But he can't. He cannot change. The New King James says there's no variation. There's no shadow of turning because God does not, cannot change who he is. And this is so important to note. But look at this. Every good and every perfect gift I'm telling you right now, sickness and disease, it's not good. It's not perfect. We know it doesn't come from God, and but only good and perfect gifts come from God. If it's not good, it's not perfect. Forgive my grammar. It ain't from God. So we need to know that truth, renew our mind to the truth that what you are facing with right now, if it's not good, it's not perfect. If it's something that God did not create that was good, then don't blame God for that. You know, renew your mind. Get God out of the equation. He is for you, not against you. God cannot change. You know, he's not good one day and bad the next. God is like John said in his epistles. You know, he says God is light and in him is no darkness at all. You know, he's only light. You know, and what does light do? Dispel the darkness. God is good. So we're going to see here as part of that, God doesn't change his mind, his will, his promises. Uh, this is all within, I love this, in Hebrews 6. I'm going to read the message translation because I just I think it just puts it through just a really simple way that we can understand. Just really briefly with uh, translations, the King James and the New King James has been translated word for word. Uh, the other translations have been translated meaning for meaning. So sometimes if you read a few different translations, uh, you get like a, uh, a more of an amplified meaning. You bring out some of the richness and the, and, and the goodness of the point that's being made there. But I love this. Look at this. Hebrews 6, 13 to 18 in the message says, When God made his promise to Abraham, he backed it to the hilt, putting his own reputation on the line. He said, I promise that I'll bless you with everything I have. Bless and bless and bless. <laughs> Can you know? Do you know what we just shared there? That God cannot reverse the blessing. And what did Paul say in Galatians three? Those who are of faith are blessed along with believing Abraham. If you believe in Jesus, you have got this same blessing um, that God pronounced over Abraham on your life. In fact, we have more than Abraham. And we'll see this. Look at this. This is Abraham stuck it out and got everything that had been promised to him. When people make promises, they guarantee them by appeal to some authority above them so that if there's any question that they'll make good on the promise, the authority will back them up. When God wanted to guarantee his promises, he gave his word a rock solid guarantee. God can't break his word and because his word cannot change the promise likewise is unchangeable so god cannot lie god cannot change his mind he cannot um, reverse a blessing he cannot curse what he is blessed in fact no one can curse what god has blessed get that let that truth set you free you know that god cannot break his word he cannot change his promise. Can you see here? His promise is unchangeable. So what God has promised cannot change. This is so exciting. And I, I really do pray that you get a hold of this simple truth because the truth will make you free. Let's look at this in a little bit more detail, verses 17 to 18. 
So God's promise, because he says there's two, I think the New King James says there's two um, things about God that are unchangeable. And it's his promise and his oath. So he promised with an oath. They're both unchangeable as well. But look at the New Living Translation in Hebrews 17 to 18. It says, God also bound himself with an oath so that those who received the promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable. But look at this, because it is impossible for God to lie. See, if God said something, if God has blessed you, uh, he cannot change it. He cannot take it back. He cannot alter it. This is good news. You know, and let the truth make you free. God is on your side. He is with you. He is for you. But this is, look at this. It says, so that those who receive the promise, that's us. We receive the promise ultimately that what God gave to Abraham. God proved to Abraham, like he promised him Isaac. He got Isaac and everything else there that, that God had promised him through Isaac that, you know, and he said that God promised him to prove to us how unchanging his promise and his oath is. The New International Version of verse 17 says, because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. We are the heirs to what was promised because ultimately it was about eternal life. Okay. Ultimately, that's what God has promised. And Abraham uh, became righteous by faith because he believed in Jesus. And that is the covenant that we now have through Jesus. We have the fulfillment of what Abraham had and what he was walking towards. You know, it, that is so exciting. And I'm going to share a message a little bit later on. God willing, you know, I've wanted to be sh shared it for a while now on Abraham and the promise that God made to Abraham and and uh, just to go through his journey with Abraham and Sarah and their journey with Isaac. Because I want to bring out some amazing truths for you. Because what we do, and, and like I've listed in my book, God's Plan for Pregnancy, I've listed the couples that were um, infertile or barren in the Bible and, and just went through some a little bit of the accounts account and just gave you the references there as well of what happened. But what I don't want you to do is go into those accounts and look at everything they did and try and pull it apart. Why? Because we have something far greater than every single one of them. While Abraham and Sarah's journey is an exciting one and there's a lot of amazing truths you can draw from it, always remember we have something far greater. We have the fulfillment of what God promised to Abraham. We are far greater. I mean, God said, uh, sorry, Jesus said, he said um, that John the Baptist was the greatest of all the prophets and and um, and everything that came in. He was the greatest of all of them. And he said, those who are least in the kingdom are greater than John the Baptist. You know, John the Baptist was greater than everybody under that old uh, uh, covenant. But those who are least in the kingdom are greater. Why? Because we have a better covenant based on better promises than what we have. We have the fulfillment of of everything that the Mosaic law was pointing to. It was pointing to Jesus and his finished work. We're not walking towards that. Abraham is walking towards that. We are walking from it. You know, it was a promise to him. It's a provision to us. We are looking back to what Jesus has done for us. Love it. And even when you read through Hebrews 11, the great faith chapter, keep reading. You know, there's, I used to get stuck on all those amazing people in Hebrews 11. But if you read at the end of that, it says we have something far greater than all of them. Because why? We have the fulfillment. We have Jesus and his finished work. And you keep reading Hebrews and you turn to chapter 12. You know, if you keep reading and get rid of all the chapters, it says, look under Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. You know, it says he despised the shame that was set before him. And then, at, you know, at the end of that passage, he said he sat down at the right hand of the Father. That is our position. That's what we have. Jesus and his finished work. Something far greater than all these amazing uh, people have. So, you know, don't get stuck looking at Abraham. You've got someone greater. Look to Jesus and his finished work. Uh, and I pray that will be a blessing to you.
So, okay, so what did we go through there? That God cannot, he cannot break his promise. He cannot, you know, his oath and his promise are unchangeable. His will, his nature, his character are unchangeable. God cannot change. He cannot lie. You know, it's impossible for him to lie. It's impossible for God to, to change his promise in his promises. Amen. So here we see that God cannot and we're going to continue with that, alter his word or break his covenant. And Psalm 89, 34 says that. It says that, that my covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. God cannot break his covenant. When God has established a covenant, it is rock solid. It cannot be broken. God cannot reverse the blessing. He cannot change. He cannot lie. He cannot prove false. You know, this is good news to us. And we just read in the message version in, in Hebrews 6, 18. Again, we just shared this, that God can, can't can break his word. And because his word cannot change, the promise is likewise unchangeable. He cannot break it. He cannot alter it. Amen. It's good. But to us, remember, the promises that God has made, uh, to always look at, those the promises and what the promises are referring to okay because we 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 are on a particular side of the cross okay because if you look at yourself like through the eyes of abraham and through the eyes of uh anybody else that even hannah and elkanah uh all those old testament um saints they were on the the before the cross they were walking towards the cross and what jesus was going to do we are walking from Jesus' finished work. So God's promises to them are provisions to us. So healing, for example, healing of anything. Remember, those who are wanting family, infertility and miscarriage, are just different forms of sickness and disease operating in reproductive health. So that healing is not a future tense promise for us. Under the new covenant, it is a past tense provision because the Father has provided healing for us through Jesus and what he did on the cross for us. So in the same way, in the same manner that Jesus hung on the cross and paid the price for our sin, he also paid the price for sickness and disease and everything else that came into that to this world through the fall. You know, and one thing I love to say, which I feel summarizes everything, is that Jesus was the last Adam that came and redeemed mankind from everything that the first Adam brought upon us. You know, amen. Thank God for Jesus. So look at this, 2 Corinthians 1.20, the New Living Translation says, for all of God's promises, look at this, have been fulfilled in Christ. What's have been? What tense is that? past tense all the promises of god have been fulfilled in christ with a resounding yes and through christ our amen and the new living translation says which means yes ascends to god for his glory amen actually means so it is finished or so be it so and other translations say um so we can say the amen because god said the yes we can say the amen or we can say that it is finished or that we can say the so be it. That's what I may I mean means. So be it. You know, Jesus paid the price for healing for me on the cross. So I declare healing on my body. So be it. You know, it's so powerful when you understand that. So all the promises are provisions. God cannot change his promise. We just read there. His promise. Look at this. In the 18, his promise is unchangeable. And it's even more unchangeable because it's now our provision, because it's not a future tense promise. Everything that Jesus did for us is a past tense provision. It's our inheritance. Good news. I hope everybody's been blessed by this today. I don't know if anybody is still on there watching, but uh, otherwise I'm going to preach myself happy. <laughs> At least I'm preaching to myself here. Another thing we see about what God cannot do, God cannot test us or tempt us. Uh, more specifically, he cannot test or tempt you with anything that is not good and that is not perfect or that is evil. 
And James 1.13 says, he says, let no one say when he's tempted. And I think it's the, I think there's a new King James. The NIV says, let no man say. So let no one say, let no man say, let no woman say when you are tempted that God is tempting me. For God cannot, can you see this? God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. So if something looks on the surface to be contradictory, we've got to look and rightly divide and dig a bit deeper to see what that is actually saying. Because God cannot lie, he cannot change his mind, and he cannot tempt you with evil. Now I shared before, this word tempt in Greek means test, tried, assayed, or put to the test. So God cannot tempt you, test you, try you, or put you to the test. It's not who he is. It's not his nature and character. And in fact, that God, and you look at Jesus, Jesus never used evil. Jesus never allowed evil. He opposed evil. In fact, God sent Jesus. God came down as Jesus to destroy evil. That is God's will for you. You know, you might say that, um, you know, why is this suffering in this world? You know, well, God's allowing it. No, he doesn't. God sent Jesus to disallow it. God sent Jesus to deal with evil, to put an end to evil. And it's now in our authority to continue what Jesus did. God provided uh, the solution. God gave us Jesus' power and authority. Then we need to hear and respond and, and, and listen to Jesus so that we can continue to do what he did and greater things. I mean, Jesus only did what he heard and saw from the Father. Let's uh, do likewise. You know, let's have an ear to hear and an eye to see what he's saying, what he's doing, um, what he wants to do in us and through us. So Acts 10.38 says that, it's, you know, it says that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And what did he do? He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. He never allowed evil. He opposed it head on. You know, he dealt with it head on. He showed us how to deal or how, yeah, how to deal with what we face with in this fallen world. You know, he showed us that. How do you deal with sickness and disease? He healed people. How do you deal with those that are oppressed? You cast it out, you know. <laughs> How do you deal with the devil? You know, he healed people that were oppressed by the devil. And 1 John 3, 8 says, The devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might, or revealed other translations say, that he might destroy the devil's work or the works of the devil. Okay, so Jesus was revealed not to allow it, not to use it, but to destroy it, to show us how to deal with everything we face. That's what Jesus did. He showed us how to deal with everything that we face while we live in this fallen world, but he did one greater. He empowered us to do the same. Okay, so that we need to go and, and lay hold of the victory that Jesus has given us. But remember, we are post-cross. He then took everything to the cross and disarmed it, disarmed the devil and all his work. We are empowered with the same spirit that Jesus had. That's why he said it's beneficial that I go, that I send my spirit, that you can do what I do and greater things. You know, it's good news to the new covenant believer. Amen. So you can see there that God cannot test you or tempt you. God will not use evil. He will not allow evil. He proved that to us by what Jesus did on the cross. He's put a stop to evil on the cross. He disarmed it on the cross. That is God's will, that, e that evil does not um, stand. But, you know, then for us, we've got to continue to do what Jesus did, like by laying hold of what he's done and, uh, and, and walking in victory. Okay, so remember that Jesus showed us that there was two kingdoms. And this is another thing that God can, cannot do. He cannot work against himself. God's kingdom cannot work against itself. Cannot. It's impossible. And so Jesus came to reveal that there was two kingdoms. And I love uh, John 10.10. 10. I think it really does explain the simplicity. See, up until this point, the, the Old Testament, while the devil was mentioned, you don't see it, uh, see him mentioned in uh, like great... Uh, detail. You won't find one scripture where they're given authority over the devil, not once. So you see that when uh, God had came as a man, uh, a sinless man to come and he gave us his power and authority 
uh, to deal uh, with the devil. So when Jesus came, he also revealed that there were the two kingdoms. See, in the old covenant, they believed that everything good came from God and everything bad came from God. And really that, that sort of old, um, like a pagan, if you like, um, belief system, which is a, like of dualism and Zoroasterism and um, even Gnosticism, it's the, the core belief that God's both good and evil. Um, it's like this yin and yang, if you like, and it's so dualism, and it's in equal proportions, but it's actually not the truth at all. That's not who God is. Satan is no match for God, okay? He is a created being. God is the creator, and he is a defeated foe. Uh, so the whole yin and yang dualism belief system is so untrue. Um, and so we've really got to renew our mind to the truth when we really start to look at scripture and how we really approach the goodness of God. So John 10.10, 10, let me go back to my notes here, uh, says the thief doesn't come except to steal, to kill and destroy. And Jesus says, I've come that you have life and that you have it more abundantly. So there's two kingdoms. One, the th the, there's a thief and he comes only to kill, to steal and destroy. But Jesus says, but I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. So if there's any killing, stealing or destroying in your life, it comes from a thief. It doesn't come from the father. Okay, it's not good, it's not perfect, it doesn't come from his kingdom. Now, I'm not saying this to, to make you fearful because I don't believe everything is from the adversary at all. Um, we live in a fallen world, remember, with fallen people. Um, so always remember that as well. But see, again, look at this. That king, let's go to my notes again. So God's kingdom cannot work against itself. And this is in Matthew 12, 24 to 28. And I've mentioned this a few times in a, a few different um, messages. Now, I'm just going to share the scriptures with you on this. So it says now, so Jesus delivered a man um, and the Pharisees had an absolute fit and said, basically said he's healing in demonic power. Uh, and and so this is where we pick it up. And so, so from verse 24, now when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself will not stand or cannot stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? I love what he's referring to there. So he says, therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. And the kingdom of God is only good, only perfect. It's to deliver, to redeem, to set you free. So what Jesus is saying is if I've come, like if the devil has made this person sick and oppressed them, and if I've come in the power of Bills above, if I've come in the devil's power and delivered them and healed them, then, and that means that Satan's kingdom is working against itself and a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. Okay? A kingdom cannot work against itself. So in the same way, if God is making people sick or allowing people to be sick and then sending Jesus to heal them of the sickness, the same truth applies that God's kingdom cannot uh, work against itself. It won't stand. It'll break. It'll break down. But they're two opposing kingdom. One is to, to kill and destroy. The other is only to redeem, to deliver and to give life because God cannot change. He can't be healer one day and not the next. He can't be good one day and not the next because he can not change. He is love. And if you another th truth, I want you to know that healing isn't what God does. One of his names, Jehovah Rapha or Rafika, the Lord, my healer or physician, healing is who he is. It's not what he does. You know, it's who he is. So if you come in the presence of the healer, he can't not but heal because it's who he is. And, and Jesus, I love what Paul wrote in most of his letters, especially in Ephesians. He says that basically that God and Jesus want to be your all in all. I mean, if those of you that need a healing in the area of infertility and miscarriage and or anything in reproductive or those that need healing in your body in any other area, you know, God doesn't want you just to approach him as healer and just go for the healing. 
You know, he wants to be your all in all. He wants to be your savior, your healer, your deliverer, your victory, that always present with you, you know, to be your all in all, whatever you need, that he can fulfill you in every area of life, that Jesus and his finished work can be outworking in every area of your life. You know, and for those, this is just a side thing that I find really powerful when I'm ministering to people is that, um, and and like if you can sense the presence of God, if you can, uh, just whether it's a spiritual sense or know that he's with you or you actually can feel God's peace. Uh, now, if you don't, don't um, get um, dismayed about that because it's not about your feelings. Remember, God is spirit. How we communicate with God is spirit to spirit. Sometimes we that does overflow and you can sense that in your natural man. That's okay. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong if you, you've never experienced that. So don't, don't beat yourself up if you haven't. But if you have, if you can just sense God's peace and know God's peace is with you, because God is healer, every time you sense that presence, that's the healing right there. Because God cannot separate healing from himself. Because it's not something he does, it's something of who he is. Same with deliverance. <laughs> it's not something he does, it's who he is. Every time you connect with him, you're connecting with the healing, the healer. And so if you ever sense the presence of God, that's the healing right there. We limit how God can flow through us sometimes through understanding. Or we try too hard. But it's God's design, his kingdom to flow in our lives and through our lives so incredibly simple, sim really simple. Okay, and, and I think it's that simple that when you really get a hold of it, I remember I used to say to God, no, this can't be, this can't be it. This is too simple. It's too simple. You know, it's not easy because it took me a long way to get there, to unlearn and to, to find that place. So it wasn't easy per se, but, but it was when I got there. It was like, this is too easy. This is too simple. And then God used to say to me, you've got it. You've got it. That's it. You've got it. And it's like, why didn't I get this earlier? It's because we've been taught out of it. We've been taught all this stuff that maybe God's testing you. Maybe God this. Maybe God that. Maybe you're not doing enough. Maybe you're not praying enough. And then it puts a breakthrough on you and then what you can do. Not on Jesus and what he's already done. It makes it too difficult for us. And, and it becomes confusing. But I just want to show you, I want to keep preaching the goodness of God because I honestly believe that when you know God's goodness and you know that God is on your side, he is with you, he is for you, he cannot lie, he cannot change his mind, he cannot break or alter his word, he cannot break or alter his covenant or his promise, his fulfilled promises. You know that that truth, it does make you free. It, I find that it just helps you to be able to rest in your relationship with the Father, knowing and just allowing his goodness to flow in and through you. Okay, so again, I've said on the bottom of these notes here, going back to my notes here, so kingdom divided against itself cannot stand, but God's kingdom also can't work against itself. It's always healing, it's always deliverance, it's always love, it's always goodness. So where what I shared here in Matthew 12, you know, the same truth applies. You know, if God is closing wombs or causing barrenness and then opening wombs and healing people of barrenness, that means God's kingdom is working against itself. So there are some scriptures on the surface that look like it appears that God has closed wombs. Um, there are figures of speech at play. There's something deeper there that we can bring tonight, which I don't have time to go through today, but it is not literal. God blessed Adam and Eve, he blessed them and said, go forth, be fruitful and multiply. God cannot reverse that blessing. He cannot curse what he has blessed. He cannot close what he has opened. You know, amen? He's good and only good. The next thing we're going to see is God cannot give and take away. And I'm going to share a well-known scripture in a second because if you're uh, like how I was, you'll be going, but what about Job? And we'll cover him very briefly in a second. But the reality is what God says himself out of his own mouth is that he cannot give and then take away. So you know why? Because all of God's gifts, all of God's callings, all of God's promises are irrevocable. You know what irrevocable means? Unchanging. 
you know, without repentance or without God changing his mind, which is what repentance means, which God cannot change his mind. He cannot give and then take away. Just like free will, when he gave free will, he cannot take it back. He cannot block it. He cannot stop it, go in and stop how God will uh, work through man today, he will woo us, he will guide us, he will lead us. We have the free will to hear and respond or to harden our heart and go, no, I know better, I'm going to go my own way. And because he respects freedom of will, we have that free will choice to do that, either to accept or to reject. But I honestly believe God will always be wooing us with his love and with his goodness. But look at this. Romans eleven twenty nine. 29, the Amplified Version says, For all of God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Look at this. He never withdraws them once they are given, and he does not change his mind about those to whom he gives his grace or to whom he sends his call. Who has he given grace to? Or You know, everyone who believes in Jesus. God's grace was for all of mankind so that anyone who believes in Jesus will not perish but will have everlasting life. Salvation is a gift, okay? Uh, he cannot give a gift and take it away. The Holy Spirit who brings salvation, because there's only one gift, it's the Holy Spirit, and through the Holy Spirit comes salvation, comes healing, comes all the ministry gifts, comes all the power gifts, and comes through everything of the kingdom, through the gift of the Holy Spirit. And what God gives, he cannot take away. It is him possible as we have seen as we've read through those scriptures okay so he cannot withdraw once he gives something he cannot take it back the message version says for god's gifts and god's call are under full warranty never cancelled never rescinded and the ceb translation says that god's gifts and calling can't be taken back so god cannot give and god cannot take it away again the Good News Translation says, For God does not change his mind about whom he chooses and blesses. And, and God chooses all mankind. Um, the Predestination is another thing for another day. I have messages on my website on that. and The message is called Predestined for Glory. Uh, it's not literally, the only one that was predestined was Jesus. And predestined means predetermined. And it was predetermined before the foundation or the creation of the world that everyone who believes in Jesus will, and this is what was predestined, not who, but what. I mean, Jesus was predestined, but not you and me individually, but what was predetermined for us, that everyone that comes into salvation, it has been predetermined that, that we will be conformed into the very image of Jesus. And you can see that in Romans 8. And then um, it was also predetermined that they, we would be adopted as sons in Ephesians 1. And then it looks on the surface in Romans 8 that he, call, um, that he calls, but calls, the word called means there in the Greek to, to give name to, to, cho to, to choose or to call. It means to give name to, to name or to command. So he also called or commanded that we would be blessed that we'd be justified, that we'd be glorified, and whatever that says there in Romans 8 there. So that's kind of the context. But I do have a message that goes through that in detail on that one. So God, what do we see? God cannot give and take away. And this is, you might be thinking, you know, yep, yeah, but what about Job? Yep, let's look at Job. We're just going to do this very briefly. Once again, I have a message which I've been wanting to share for some time on Job. I'm not going to go through it today. It would be a few hours long, so I'd have to break it up a little bit for you because there's a lot we've got to cover first before we can even break down Job chapter 1 and chapter 2, unfortunately, uh, because we've been taught so much stuff that's untrue, we miss it. But this is, this is the reference. I'm only going to touch it today, but I'm going to give you enough to show you how to rightly divide in a very simple form the book of Job. Job 1.21, Job said... Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, I, I don't know about you, but if you read Job chapter 1 and what happened to him, he lost all his children, he lost everything he owned, he was covered, ended up being covered with soils and sores and boils and lost absolutely everything. He was totally humiliated, and he says, God gives and God takes away. Bless the name of the Lord. His theology is whacked. I'm sorry, but that's 
madness. Now, we say, oh, how righteous and holy is Job for saying this. But do you know that Job said this when he actually had no understanding of who God is? And if you don't believe me, we're going to go through a scripture in a second. But one thing I want to point out here, God did not say this. God didn't say, I give and take away. Job said this. Job said, so yes, it's true. It says that God gives and takes away, but it's not the truth because it wasn't said by God. It was spoken by Job in his own understanding. So this is why it's so importantly, important that we learn to rightly divide what we read in the Bible. Who is saying what to whom and why is the number one thing we need to look at. God did not say this. Job said this. And look, look at this. Let's go to the last chapter of the book of Job. Let's look at the end. And, and James actually says something pretty um, significant. He says, let's consider the end of Job because he's, he was doubly blessed in the end from the beginning. You know, that's all he says. So let, that's the whole point of the book of the Job, right? The end, not the beginning, not the middle, the end. That Job, just very, very briefly, I didn't plan to do this, but I just can't help myself, is that Job was actually the very first book, book written of the Bible. The book is the Bible is not outlaid in chronological order. If it was, the book of Job would be first. Job was written probably around the time of um, Moses when he, he remember he'd killed the Egyptian and he was uh, in the wilderness. There's other people that put him um, scholars that put him a lot earlier, but that's probably around the consensus of around where Job was. But this is way before the law, okay? Uh, <laughs> quite a few years before the law was established. The man is sacrificing and doing a whole bunch of stuff. Why? It wasn't even established. It wasn't a law. He was doing a bunch of stuff. And if you like, it was fire insurance. If I do all this sacrificing, if I do all this stuff, then, then God will bless me. Okay, it was a works-based righteousness. We're going to break this down and go through this in a lot more detail. God willing, if I share this later on. But, but let's now go to the end of Job. This is the key here. The last chapter of Job. Now look what comes out of Job's mouth. In verses 5 to 6, and this is the New King James, he says, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, he goes, I abhor myself and I repent in dust and ashes. Uh, the message says, I admit I once lived by rumors of you. Now I have it all firsthand from my own eyes and ears. Look what he says. I'm sorry, forgive me. I'll never do that again, I promise. I'll never again live on crusts of hearsay or crumbs of rumors. Okay, so, you know, all these people say that, but what about Job? I mean, my answer here is it's a very simple response, but what about Jesus? <laughs> Now, it says that Job is upright and blameless. If you look at those words, it's not the same words that we use. It means moral, it was, means pious. It means morally upstanding and pious. It's not righteous. It's not the same righteousness of faith that Abraham of what we now have. He was doing everything good in, in and of himself. It was all based on his good works and, and what he did. So everything that was written prior to Job 20, uh, 42, the last chapter, Job says, forgive me, I spoke with no understanding. Right here, when he actually came into the, I believe, the pre-incarnate Jesus and met him, and he then knew who God was. See, I, he said, I used to live on rumors of you. And the New King James, I'd only heard of you through the hearing of the ear, but now he's saying, but now I see you. Now I know you. And what does he do? I'm sorry, forgive me. Other version says, you know, I repent. You know, I change my mind. You know, he didn't have it all. Um, the other thing is just everybody gets hung up with um, the first uh, chapter of chapter one, you know, where it looks like God says, behold, all he has is in your power that God's giving permission. Remember, God cannot lie. Uh, you cannot um, lie and say, you know, whatever. I'm, say, the, the reality is Satan had authority over this fallen world. Uh, that's not the whole fullness of that there. There's a, a whole lot more uh, that goes into that. But the bottom line is we're under the new covenant. Satan can't accuse anybody. Uh, since the cross. Job was pre-cross, he was pre-law, um, and he didn't have a relationship with God until the end. 
Okay, so Job said God gives and takes away. That is Job's theology. That is not Jesus. That's not God's theology. It's not the truth. It's true that Job said it. It's true. Job meant it, but it's not the truth. So that's why Bible interpretation is so important that you look at who is saying what to whom and why. But always remember, if someone says to you, but yeah, but what about Job? You respond with, but yeah, what about Jesus? Because that is who I, who I um, identify with. He's my representation. He, I'm in him and he is in me. He's seated at the right hand of the Father and so am I. So let's move on because I really <laughs> will need to go quickly. Okay. Yes, so let's hurry. So God cannot show favoritism is the next one. Um, and some translations say partiality, which means favoritism. Acts 10.34, Peter says um, that in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. The NIV says that God shows no favoritism. The New Living Version says, or the New Life Version rather says, um, God does not respect one person more than another. And, uh, and and the other reference there is Romans 2.11. It says, God does not love some people more than others. So God does not have favorites. He does not show partiality. He does not show favoritism, which means what God did through Jesus, what he did through the finished work of the cross is freely available to all. God does not choose to bless someone over another. God does not choose who gets children, who doesn't get children. God does not choose who gets healed, who doesn't get healed. What God did through Jesus is God's will. We covered this at the beginning for all of mankind. Okay, so hopefully this will help you to, to, to come to the truth that God has not forgotten you. God is not withholding. God is not the result or the, the reason why you may have not experienced your breakthrough yet. Okay, God's gifts are freely available to all, to all who believe in Jesus. And uh, this coming to the, the finish line now here, the other thing God cannot do, he cannot withhold any good thing from you. Psalm 84, 11 says, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Now, to walk uprightly or to be righteous for us under the new covenant comes by faith in Jesus. It's gifted to us. How we walk out outrightly, therefore, is to put our faith in Jesus, not through our own works, not through looking at our own walk and how we walk, what we do, good and bad, but looking at Jesus and putting our faith in him and living by faith in him. Amen. So it's good news. God cannot withhold any good thing from you. Okay, Jesus is good. His covenant is good. The finished work of the cross is good. Only good and perfect gifts come from God. Always remember the price has been paid. The victory already won for you. You know, God is, is the solution for you. He is the answer. He is always on your side. Now, I'm just going to have to whiz through my last three PowerPoint slides here. So if you're watching this, um, maybe get on YouTube when it's been uploaded and you can pause and read everything else that I've shared there. But let's put this together. This is what I've covered today. God, who is love, he cannot change. This is, But this is also what God cannot do. He cannot force his own will or way upon you. We need to respond. He cannot lie. He cannot reverse the blessing that he's pronounced upon you. One, uh, at creation, and two, through Jesus in Ephesians 1, 3, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. No one can curse. Not God can't. No one can curse what God has blessed. You're blessed. No one can reverse it. No one can, can undo that. God cannot change his nature or his character. He cannot change his mind. He cannot change his will, his plan, his purpose. He cannot change his word. He cannot alter his covenant. He cannot break or change his promises. He cannot test or try or um, put you to the test at all or with evil. He cannot work against his own kingdom. He cannot give and then take away because all of his gifts are irrevocable. Once he gives them, that's it. It's done. Once God says and pronounces something, what he once he cuts a covenant, and remember the new covenant was cut between Jesus and himself, it cannot be reversed. It cannot be broken. 
It cannot. It is impossible. Okay, so God cannot show partiality or favoritism, he, which means he doesn't choose to bless one over another. God poured out Jesus for all of mankind so that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. What Jesus did is freely available to everyone. And the last thing we just covered is that God cannot withhold good from you. Amen. So we see here, and you've heard me say this before, but hopefully now I can prove it to you through what God says himself about his nature and his character and his word, that God cannot, what God has done through Jesus and his finished work, which he's paid the price for sin, for all sin, for sickness and disease and everything else that came through that fall. Remember what Jesus and his finished work, what he did is not a future tense promise. It's a past tense provision. So get yourself established in that truth. Know that truth because when you do, you will then understand why I say that why God cannot block it, stop it, delay it or withdraw it from your life. He cannot stop the healing power of Jesus from operating. Why? Because it's done. It's established. It's impossible for God to change his mind. So if someone says to you that maybe it's not God's will, maybe God's waiting for a perfect time, can you see that it speaks contrary to what God's word says about himself? That would mean that God has stepped in and broken his word, altered his covenant, stopped or withholding the healing blood and redeeming blood of Jesus from outworking in your life. And that's impossible. I hope you can understand. I hope you can see that today. It is impossible. God cannot block it or stop it or delay it. It is good news. And I hope this truth will make you free. So on closing today, I just want to encourage you, don't judge God's love for yourself based on your circumstances and what you go through. It's a poor way to measure God's love for you. Now, um, there's just a real worldly belief that's crept into the church and it's that when if something's good happening to you, then you're blessed. Something bad's happening to you, it's cursed. It's a world system. It's not God's way of think. certainly not God's way of how his kingdom operates. The reality is bad things happen to good people. You know, that the, the anyone can experience sickness or disease, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever. But let's look at not the problem, not the cause, not the root. Let's always look to the solution, which is Jesus and his finished work. And never lie. And I don't want to make it sound like an absolute. And I don't want you to feel guilty if you've done it, because I know I have as well. So when I say don't judge God's love based on your circumstances. So, I mean, don't look at your circumstances. And if you're not experiencing a breakthrough or things haven't gone as planned, and maybe you've experienced loss after loss and, and, and just... Um, been through just you know hit one wall after another wall is don't judge God's will based through what you've experienced I know it's difficult I know it's hard to do that but I just hope that truth today has brought truth and will help you in that God loves you regardless he cannot change regardless always remember if for those that are wanting children the the reason why um, you're not experiencing it. It's never, never because God has stepped in and stopped or blocked or delayed something. It's never because he's waiting for a perfect time to do what he's already done. He's already done it. He can't stop. He can't block it. It's there. The reason is there's some form of sickness or disease. There's something that's operating. But that's why I say always look to Jesus because he is your solution that he provided the answer for you, that you can lay hold of the victory you need. I mean, if those of you that are struggling with unexplained infertility, I know how frustrating that can be because there's nothing there to pinpoint, but it doesn't matter because Jesus is still your solution. He is still your answer. Regardless of what you're facing, Jesus is more than enough for you and your breakthrough. So let me encourage you to look to him and his finished work. And as well, don't judge God's will for your life also based on your circumstances because that's where all this theology and all this bad teaching has come from. You know, that maybe it wasn't God's will for me. Like you pray for a healing and you didn't get healed and you go, well, maybe it wasn't God's will. So what we're doing, we're judging God's will based upon our circumstances, not based on Jesus' finished work and what he's already done because Jesus' finished work is his will for us, for all mankind. And if we don't experience it, like I've already covered, it's not, let's get God out of the equation. It's not that God has blocked or stopped, delayed or anything. 
is we live in a fallen world, bad things happen to good people. So let's get God. God is good. God is only good. He is healer. He is deliverer. He is savior. He wants to be your all in all. And, and the other thing I don't want you to do is to look at yourself and go, well, where am I missing it here? Uh, which is a natural thing to do. It, it, you know, in some cases, it, it, you know, not many, um, it can be helpful, but we need to be very, very careful because what we do, if we're going to look to ourselves and where we may be missing something or um, when we're putting the breakthrough on us and what we could have done better or what we could do, be doing better, that then makes the breakthrough dependent on us and what we can or cannot do. Then you start because you're only as good as your performance. We have no healing in and of ourselves, but the spirit of God that lives in us is the healer. You know, the same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in you and lives in me. You have access to that. So just I encourage you not to go to that temptation to look at yourself and why am I missing it? Um, you know, we know you've got God out of the equation, so we can't blame him either. Don't blame yourself, but always just keep it simple and look to the solution, which is Jesus. He is more than enough for you in any area of life. What he has done for you, you know, because he's already equipped and empowered you with the same spirit that he had, uh, the, the same spirit that anointed Jesus while he performed all those miracles here on this earth is the very same spirit who now lives in you. You are now post-cross. You know, you have the same power and authority of Jesus and the spirit of him at work in you. So you can see the supernatural uh, in your life as well. So I pray that uh, this has blessed you and um, uh, really will help you in your journey. And I, I'm not going to go through this, but you can, if those who have watched my message, The Prayer of Faith, I covered that um, the word receive means lombano in Greek. And lombano means to seize, to grasp, to lay hold of. So once you understand Jesus' finished work, we can now receive, which means lambano, go make use of it, lay hold of what Jesus has done for you. And so now that you know that God's not blocking or stopping or delaying, that God is not to blame in any way, shape or form, that the provision, your healing is there, your deliverance, whatever breakthrough you need, that it is there through Jesus and his finished work. Now go and, and have an ear to hear. Let, let Jesus show you how to lay hold of this victory. Uh, don't do it just because I've told you. Just through your relationship, let him guide you and lead you every step of the way. You know, and I've made a point here. It is, it is simple. It really is. Uh, but don't, just one thing, don't be legalistic or rigid. Um, sometimes we can put God in a box and go, you know, especially when it's with healing, this is the way I'm going to be healed and, and no other way. You know, this is it. And we can get so legalistic and not, so rigid. And I just use that as an example. And sometimes we really do need to be led by God in our journey. Never, ever, ever look at somebody else in their journey or their belief system. We don't know what they truly believe for a start, right? But never judge other people. You know, at the end of the day, this is your journey. You've got to live it. You've got to walk it. And so let what decisions you make in your journey be between you. Uh, if it's for children, for example, for you, your partner, your spouse, and the Lord. It's nobody else's business. It's between you two. Let him guide you and lead you. What's good for you may not be good for somebody else. You know, may not work for them. So that's why we need wisdom uh, with what we share as well. So let him guide you and lead you. Okay, it's your journey. Uh, never compare yourself to other people. So I pray that this has been a blessing to you. Now, I've started the workbook. I've been so incredibly busy this month. Uh, I've started a new series on fasting in church, uh, which is like becoming a seven or eight part series. So I've been spending, even though it was already written, I'm just, just the PowerPoint and the stuff of that. Um, so I haven't really got to finish this yet, but I hope to have the workbook for today up on my um, website really soon. I'll add a little bit more detail to what I've shared today. I'll have all my, like what you saw on my PowerPoint slides, I'll have in the workbook with space at the bottom and I'll put some other bits and pieces that I didn't have on my slides just to help you to be able to go and look at these scriptures for yourself and then, you know, and be able to annotate and put your own notes to it and your own thoughts to it. Um, something that you can refer to later down the track. So I just hope this has become um, a blessing to you. Yep, I've just looked on the notes here. Someone said, what about questions? Yep, you know what? I'm going to finish um, here on this point. I'll close in prayer and we'll finish. 
and uh, then what I'll do is I will stay online for a little bit and I will answer some questions for you. Um, if possible, if you can send me questions pertaining to this message, just to keep it on point and on track. I'm not opposed to questions at all. I think they're a great place to learn. Uh, but down the track, I do, God willing, want to do a QA. and a and, But what I would do there is get you to email your questions in and then I can read them out and read my response and just do a bit of prep and just so I can have a PowerPoint slide um, with some scriptures to help you in that um, when I do that. I've wanted to do that for a while as well. So um, God willing, I say, because um, I really need to be led uh, with what I share with you because I really want it to be a word in season and I do believe that today's message I know even if it only blesses one person today even if only one person's life is changed and transformed you know then that 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 flicks my switch that ticks all my boxes you know that if someone is blessed and so that's what I want to do I want to have an ear to hear what the Lord is saying uh, to me to be able to share with you to be able to help you in your journey but I know that there's more than one that is going to be blessed today because I know it will be a word in season to refresh those who are weary so now God is only ever and always good let me in close in prayer so if you want to you can stay online with me and I'll answer some questions but I'll, I'll get off camera but I'll just go on the chat on my Facebook page under this live message so if, if you want to um, I'll quick flick through I haven't been able to read the comments while I, I'm preaching because the camera's here and my notes are down there um, so I'd be looking down like this <laughs> not a good look looking at the top of my head so um, and I'm desperate need for a haircut so let me close thank you Jesus and I want to pray for every single one of you right now that that whoever needs a breakthrough in, in any area of life I know not everybody's wanting children or a breakthrough in reproduction. I know there's other people with other forms of sickness and disease. I know other people that are not even sick. They need breakthrough in other areas. But right now, I hold every single one of you that's under the sound of my voice right now. And I pray that, Father, that your goodness will shine forth to them. Father, you live in me and you live in them. The same spirit that has anointed me and it has anointed them. You live in them. In fact, the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead lives in you, lives in them. And I put a demand on the kingdom that is in you right now. And I call forth healing from the spirit of God that it lives in your mortal body. I call forth healing into your physical body right now. I command for the men and women who are sterile and barren, I call and or infertile. I call forth the resurrection life and power of Jesus Christ right now to bring life to your mortal body, to restore your body to perfect health and wholeness. I command, men, I command your loins to be fruitful. Women, I command your womb to be open. You are to conceive seed. You are to be fruitful. Go forth and multiply. And I pray, you know, can, that blessing that God pronounced upon Adam and Eve, I declare that same blessing that what God has already declared over your life, that you will be fruitful and you will uh, multiply, that you will not miscarry, you will not be barren. And Father, I pray that for a complete victory over those that are struggling in this area and those that have lost baby after baby, those that, are, that have got just genetic disorders with their children or in their bodies, I declare perfect health and wholeness to manifest right now in you and through you in the mighty name of Jesus and Father I thank you for your goodness I thank you Father that everything of who you are will be revealed to them and and you know the more you look to Jesus and it's so simple you are transformed from glory to glory so don't look at your circumstances don't look to your past don't look to me God heaven forbid Look to Jesus, because when you look to him, you are transformed from glory to glory to glory. God bless you all, and I look forward to sharing with you next time. Amen. Amen. Amen.